it's a blessing to see all of you here today, and I trust that the Lord has led every single person here because the Lord wishes to speak to every single person here. And I'm, I'm grateful to be able to be part of what's happening here, so um, I'm just grateful. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace upon us in all of the remembered and all the forgotten ways. Lord, you care for us. The ability to get up, the ability to stand and walk and have strength to speak and to think. The fact that our heart beats without having to check with anyone but you. I thank you, Lord, that you have brought us all here, every one of us, and I believe your word, <clears throat> timeless as it is, spiritual and eternal as it is, that you have something for each one of us today. So Lord, as your sheep, we come and pray that you might feed us, that our souls might be strengthened as we soak in a world that wants to pack things onto our back. I pray that you teach us, Lord, to lay those things at your feet. You know the heart of every person here. You know exactly what we struggle with. You know our victories. You know our sorrows. And Lord, I know that you want to be part of every one of them. So Lord, we invite you at this time to speak to us. That your Holy Spirit might quicken your word to our lives. So that we might live for you. We might give glory to you in ways that we haven't yet. I pray that you help each one of us, Lord as we look at your word, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we're back in the book of Genesis. We're in <laughs> chapter 14, the second half, and we're gonna look the rescue of, Abraham, of Abram. He's not the one who's rescued, he's actually the one who does the rescuing. Um, if it's, it's actually he rescuing his nephew, Lot. And so we're gonna look at that, but before that, there's a war between these kings. Just to remind you where you are, Shameless plug. We've been looking at Abram, Abram and Sarai, and we've been looking at God's speaking to him and choosing him to show his glory through. And he becomes the father of all the faithful, including those of us who are not Jewish. He is the father of all the Jewish nations. And if you speak to a, a, a Jewish person, they'll know this fully. And he was told to get out and to go, and so he did. We saw that he brought some things with him as he went. He brought his father with him. He brought his nephew with him. And the Lord said, get out of your household, get away from your family and go out. But he found it hard to do. I don't know if any of you have had a similar situation. Uh, living in Jersey can be difficult and it's, it's hard to leave. But that's where God meets us, isn't it? And so last week we looked at Lot finally launching. He finally got away and it's something that, Abram wasn't necessarily obedient to God in and bringing Lot all of this way, but the Lord made it uncomfortable for them to stay together. And sometimes God uses that uncomfortability to drive us places when we won't be led. Can I get an amen? Any of you understand what that means? Being so uncomfortable, whether it be a job or a church or a place or a relationship, it just gets so uncomfortable that you gotta leave. But we like the comfortable, we like the familiar, we like the things that we, that we are, that we know, and it's, you know, the saying is better the devil you know. And so I can understand that, my heart goes out to Abram, and I look at the example and say, okay, Lord, I should be more obedient, I should be sharper. Nobody had to push Jesus to do anything, he did it willingly. He knew what the Father's will was, probably because he spent time, all the time, with his father. So we looked at him leaving, and he ends up going back to where he started, back to the, the Oaks of Mamre. Mamre is actually a guy's name, and he claimed these oak trees as his own. And so he goes back to where he met with the Lord previously before he went away and went into Egypt. We see that there's no room for them, and there are Perizzites and Canaanites in the land watching, even as they argue amongst themselves. And Abram makes a decision, says, we've, we've got to separate. And he says, listen, let's not, let's not have any disagreement. If you go one way, I'll go the other. If you go this way, I'll go that way. And he being the elder, being the uncle, shows benevolence and is 
doesn't have to do this, but he gives his nephew first pick. He says, you go anywhere you want. And so he looks at the well-watered valley of the Jordan Valley, and he goes, yeah, that's where I want to go. I want to go over there because that's like paradise. It's like the Garden of Eden. And that's where I want to take all my people, and that's where I want to go. And I just brought up the point, there is no yellow brick road, is there? There's no Emerald City at the end of the thing. And he thought that that was the place because, see, he lifted up his eyes and he saw, and it's very open uh, throughout the scriptures. It's, it's our eyes that end up being the window of temptation very often, isn't it? Whereas the scripture talks about the ears in a very different way. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And it's faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. It's very interesting that God lifts up auditory rather than visual anyway. Sometimes I go off. You'll have to forgive me. <laughs> and so he says, I'm going to Sodom. And that's what he does. And he goes even as far as Sodom. And we know Sodom has a, a bad reputation because we've read ahead in the book. And he goes to this place where the people are not doing what is right. And there's sin that just runs rampant in this area. Uh, these are all descendants of Hamites actually in this area. And uh, not a good reputation from their families. And so they pack up and they move. And it, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a wonderful life because you take yourself with you, right? Yeah. So as they go, finally, Abram is alone and he, he goes back to this altar and the Lord speaks to him. He was finally obedient to do what the Lord called him to do. And as soon as he did that, the Lord came to him and spoke to him. I don't think it's a coincidence that the Lord spoke to him after he was obedient by getting rid of Lot. So he comes to him and he speaks to him. And he makes a promise to him that if you can count the stars of the sky, you'll be able to count your descendants. Now this is the man whose name is Abram, which means exalted father, and he's childless. So even his very name rings of sarcasm. Right? Yep. Yep. Good. We looked at the difference between Abram and Lot and how Abram is a picture of, of a godly walk. He walks by faith. Lot lifts up his eyes and he sees the well-watered valley of Sodom. We see that he was generous and magnanimous. He can be generous and magnanimous because the Lord has given him everything, right? He says, look at the land, north, south, east, and west. I've given this to you. It's all yours. Everywhere you see, your descendants are going to inherit this. You can be generous when you have everything, right? I wonder what you've been given. It's easy to be generous when you've been given everything, when you've been forgiven all of your sins, past, present, and future, when you've been given an inheritance in heaven. It's easy to be generous to other people because it's, it doesn't mean much because the Lord's given us everything else so much greater. But we see Lot was greedy and worldly. We looked for God's city, Abram did, uh, whose builder and maker is God. The only thing that he really builds is altars where he gets altered. And there's a, he makes a home city in a city of judgment, Lot does. And so we see that just because you got a bunch of stuff and you've got a, what you think is a great way of life doesn't mean you have real life. And sometimes people get those things confused. We see that Abram is the father of all those who believe and Lot ends up with this heritage of incest and the people that come from his daughters and he are now the enemies of Israel, and they become a very twisted bunch, as we see in the future. Abram becomes the heir of the world. God gives him basically everything, and for Lot, he loses everything in God's judgment as it comes. So this week, we're going to look at Melchizedek and a, a war that happens. Actually, this is the very first war that happens in the scriptures, and it happens right here in the book of Genesis. Just to remind you where we are, we're going to look at the Battle of the Kings and Lot's rescue. Now, this is where you have to put on your seatbelts. Because this is Pastor Dave, who's not hooked on phonics. He's going to read a bunch of words and names. And they're repeated. So I will beg your patience. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar... Ariok, king of Eliezer, Chedolo, there it is, Cheddar, Ch 
Shador Le Omer. I practiced this, and it sounds French, but it's not. Chador Le Omer, king of Elam, the title king of the nations, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adam, uh, Adma, Sh Shemeber, king of Zeboim, the king of Bela, that is Zor. All these joined together in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. Actually, this is just south of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is constantly receding, and what it leaves is a valley of salt. So that's where this is. <clears throat> Twelve years they served Chador Leomer, and the thirteenth year they rebelled. And the fourteenth year, Chedolomer, uh, Leomer, and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephaim in Ashtaroth and Kernaim and Zuzim in Ham, and Amim in Shava, Kiriathem, and the Horites in the mountains of Seir as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. They turned back and they came to En Mishpah, that is Kadesh, it's the modern name is Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who dwelt in Haz. Hazan Tamar, and the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, the king of Bela, that is Zor, went out and joined together in battle in a valley of Siddim against Cheddar. <laughs> Shador Leomer, king of Elam, title king of the nations, Amraphel, king of Sinar, and Ariok, king of Eleazar, four kings against five. They could have just said that last part and that would have been good. <laughs> All right. So you get this guy who's the, this vassal king. He's got these nations, these five nations in subjugation underneath him. And at some point they say, we're not paying taxes anymore. We're done. We're not paying you for protection. It's like telling the mob, forget about it. We're not giving you, I'm not giving you any more money. So what they do, and, he, and this is the topography, by the way, these are the kings of the north, these four kings, this is where they are, they're on the other side of the Euphrates uh, near the Tigris, and this is the area in which these five kings reside next to the Dead Sea. And so you can see a blow up of it here on the right hand side. So Sodom, Gomorrah, all of these cities all the way down to Zor, which means little one. So it must have been the smallest one, it's further from water, but... They're, all these cities which are here, they're now going to attack from the north. They're going to come down along this river and come around, knock them out, and come back around. So it's a war, and it's the first war that's ever mentioned in the Scripture. And we know exactly where these things are. There are remnants of this. And actually, the Dead Sea that you see in this picture was much further in the area where you see the green. And these were on the borders of the 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 Dead Sea. So that's where they are. Now the Valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits. That's a great neighborhood. <laughs> asphalt pits. And the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there. And the remainder fled to the mountains. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot. Abram's brother, brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and they departed. And the one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, by the way, this is the first time Hebrew is ever mentioned in the scripture as well. For he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. So, they come in, they sweep through these five cities, they take everybody, women, children, goods, animals, everything. They destroy everything. Uh, I, I looked up an archeological report on this. Everything through this area is completely decimated down to the ground. It's just totally wiped out. These guys said, you're not gonna pay us taxes, that's no problem, you're all done. They take all their stuff, including women and children, which become possessions of the victor, and they take them away, including Abram. Abram's nephew, Lot. 
So, such an exciting thing to find in your yard. It's interesting because there, when the Bible says that there are asphalt pits, the main ingredient in that is oil. And so the Bible has actually been used for some companies to find oil in places where the scripture says there's oil. <laughs> Just thought I'd let you know. The scriptures are good if they tell you where to find money, but you know, submitting your whole life, I don't know. That's the way some people are. So, Hebrew, very first time it's mentioned, by the way, this is what it looks like in Hebrew, which is I-B-R-I. So it doesn't have all the letters that you and I understand. But what it means is you're a descendant of Eber, Hebrew. Doesn't mean that he makes coffee or anything else. And it means one from beyond or one who's crossed over. So that's actually what the name Eber means and then it becomes Hebrew. So that's where we get the name Hebrew. And now you know. A little bit of trivia this morning. And so what happens is once Lot is taken out and these guys march through, Abram is told by somebody who escapes, hey, your nephew, he's, he's got captured along with his wife and his kids and all of his stuff. He's gone. You're not going to find him anywhere in Sodom anymore. Sodom is leveled. It's all over. What would you do? Well, Abram activates. And it says, verse 14, and then Abram heard that his brother was taken captive he calls him brother because they're close relatives. It doesn't mean that the scripture's wrong. It just means they're calling him brother now. It's rather interesting that the Holy Spirit chooses that term right now. Was taken captive and armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is in the north of Damascus. Imagine having a household where you have 318 armed, trained militia. Abram was wealthy. We're talking about thousands of people. We're talking about tons and herds and herds and herds of stuff. That's why he and Lot couldn't live together. They just had too much stuff. He has 318 people at his disposal that are security. And they know how to fight. Because if you're going to do something like make a rescue, you better know what you're doing. You don't just say, oh, you know, we, we should find people. And then we should train them. Abram's ready. What do you think of that? People say, Pastor Dave, do you think that a Christian should own a gun? Well, I don't know. Abram had 318 trained soldiers. I think you should be armed. I think you should be ready for anything. If you're going to be a good steward of what you have, you're going to take care of what you have? That's why I go to the gym three days a week. <laughs> <coughs> so this is the war. The king's... The four kings come from up in here. They come down along this mountain range. When they hit the Dead Sea, they just decimate everything. And they went as far as uh, Patamaram, which is down here. And they came up and they swept through, just took all these cities, went down this far. And then he said, well, we should head home. And then they came back on this side. And they're now going to pass on this side of the Dead Sea and come up here. And this is where Abram is. This is where the, 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 the Oaks of Mamre are. Uh, not far from Jerusalem. So that's the war plan. And so what he does is he ends up tracking them. He catches them here and at night cuts them off, splits into two and comes from two different directions and he decimates everyone. He attacked and pursued them all the way up and stopped just short of Damascus, which is very, very far north and well out of their territory. And so he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot. He's called brother again, even though we know he's a nephew. And his goods, as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. And after his return from the defeat of Cheddar, Chedorle Omer, and the kings who were with him. 
So he rescues Lot, but he doesn't just rescue Lot. He takes out all of the enemy and he rescues Sodom and Gomorrah all the way down to Zor. So he rescues all of those people and all their stuff. Pretty good deal, right? Abram's a pretty good guy. And so he's got these 318 men of his own that are part of this. But he also has a couple of his neighbors that have chimed in. We know uh, this guy whose memory, he actually comes and he's part, Aner, uh, Aner is part of that. So he's got these three guys who are his neighbors who he says, hey, come on, let's go get him. And they're, all right, let's go. And they all go and they win. And then war's over, got all the stuff back. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Who's this guy? Melchizedek, which is actually a title, just shows up. Now, if you know anything about the priesthood, the priesthood, you had to be related to Levi. The Levitical priesthood only belongs to the line of Levi, which includes Aaron, the Aaronic line. He's not even born yet. And here's a priest unto God named Melchizedek who pops up and he brings him bread and wine. Peculiar. Let's take a look. Melchizedek actually means king of righteousness. So he's the king of righteousness. That sounds very familiar to me. He's only mentioned one other time in the Old Testament, and it's in Psalm 110. And David, writing this, says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. How many of you are familiar with that passage? It's mentioned in the New Testament, and it's spoken of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Interesting. So somehow this guy's pointing to Jesus. The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This is referring to Jesus, that he is a priest forever, not from the Aaronic line, not from the tribe of Levi, but from the, from the line of Melchizedek. Who's this guy that just pops up out of nowhere? There are some people who believe that this is actually a theophany, which is a pre-appearing of Jesus Christ in physical form. We can all argue about that later. But certainly he's a picture of Christ in every way, and I'll show you how. He's also the king of Salem, which means king of peace, which means he's the king over what you guys might be known as Jerusalem. So it's the city of Jerusalem. This guy's the king of Jerusalem. The only one I know that's the king of kings is Jesus. In fact, Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Yes, Christmas is coming. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's the name of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's interesting, he's called Everlasting Father. He's also called Counselor. Now, wait a minute. Those are two other parts of the Trinity. Well, that's true. But they're all one, aren't they? So it's okay. If it wasn't true, then it wouldn't be okay. But it is true. King of Salem, so he's the King of Peace, and he's also the King of Righteousness. Well, that's good. He brings out bread and wine. That sounds vaguely familiar to me. We practice communion the first Sunday of the month. We have bread and wine. Why is this suddenly showing up here in the middle of the Old Testament? Because God wants us to know when Jesus shows up, we go, <gasps> God has been pointing to him all along through all the scriptures, including here. So he brings him bread and wine. Not necessarily recommended for after a battle, but, you know, good steak is good. <laughs> but you see, the reason that this is picked is for the picture. Because bread always refers to life. Because, uh, you know, if you don't have food, 
you die. And so bread is always that way. And John 6, 35 bears this out. And Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus likens himself unto the manna that came down in the wilderness that fed the people of Israel in the wilderness. He calls himself bread. And in John 6, 48, he begins, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Now, when he said this, the Pharisees misunderstood what he said. And he goes, talking about cannibalism here. Jesus is speaking metaphorically. You get that, right? At the Last Supper, he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. He's in his body. How could it be his body? What's, what is this? This is my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. He's in his body. He's got all his blood. He's got his body. He's not pulling pieces off. It's, it's a metaphor. It's very understood to be that way, right? He's doing the same here. We, we understand. We're intelligent people. We know a metaphor when we see it. Jesus is saying he's the bread of life. And so these two symbols, bread, which refers to life or the sustaining of our lives, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. I'm the real bread that bread speaks of metaphorically. And he talks about how he, the wine and wine always in the scripture is a picture of joy. Now, of course you can have too much joy, can't you? You ever get tickled so much it hurts? You can have too much joy. Psalm 104, 15 says, and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread, which strengthens a man's heart. So we have the picture of what bread is and the picture of what wine is. Actually, a wine, wine is also a picture of the Holy Spirit, which is a, interesting. They call it a spirit. Anyway, so here Melchizedek comes out with bread and wine. Interesting early picture of communion. There are two more times that these picture Christ. Of course, you remember in Luke 22, verse 19, he says, and he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, he was speaking of something that was about to happen, not something that was happening. And we do that in remembrance looking back. He was pointing forward. And so that's the second time that we see bread and wine being a picture and pointing to Jesus. Can you think of the third time? I'll give you a minute. It's, it's, a, little, it's a little bit of a stretch. But do you remember with Joseph? Joseph, favored by his dad, gets beat up by his brothers, thrown in a hole, sold off to be a slave, sent to Egypt, works for Potiphar. He's now accused of raping Potiphar's wife or trying to assault her, and he didn't touch her. In fact, she assaulted him, and he ran away naked, which is a little embarrassing being a Hebrew. And he's out in the street, and he gets put in jail. While in jail, there are two guys that get put in jail as well. One's a baker. One's a cupbearer. One makes bread. One handles wine. It's rather interesting. They're both in the prison, and they, they say, listen, I, I had this terrible dream, and they tell Joseph the dream. He goes, there's a God in heaven who interprets dreams, and he tells me what it means. By the way, you, the baker, you're going to be hung up and die, and you, the, the, the cup holder, you're going to be restored. And guess how many days it takes? Three days. And it points to him. It points to Jesus Christ, doesn't it? Because Jesus Christ gets hung up on a cross and he dies for us, the bread. And the wine speaks of his resurrection. This guy gets pulled out of jail and he gets restored to his place with the king. And he sits there for a long time with Pharaoh before he finally remembers after Pharaoh has a bad 
bad dream that keeps recurring and nobody can tell him what it means. He goes, oh, I know a guy. And pulls him out of there. And Joseph is very much a forerunner and a picture and a metaphor for who Jesus Christ is. Uh, there are over 100 similes I could show you. It would take all day and, you know, we can't do that. So when we get there, we'll talk about it. So we see these three pictures and God is speaking to us in symbols and in forms and, and these metaphors so that when we look at Jesus, we say, this is it. This is what the whole Old Testament is pointing to, is to Jesus Christ, his son. Okay, you guys get this? I find this exciting. The funny thing is that this king of Salem, this king of righteousness is also a priest of God. Before Aaron was ever born, he's a priest of God. How, did you get, how do you get to be a priest? Somebody's got to ordain you or at least recognize God's gift on you. But he's said to be a priest of the most high God. We know, only know that there's one most high God. So he's a priest. In Hebrews 7.3, it says that he's without father, without mother, without genealogy. It's not that he didn't have a father or mother or a genealogy, but nobody knows about it. He's not boasting of it. He's not carrying his credentials in his pocket. And he's certainly not a Levite. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Speaking of Jesus Christ and how he didn't come from the tribe of Levi. He was, but Jesus Christ is our high priest, is he not? Yes. Absolutely. And in uh, 7.15, actually the whole chapter 7 speaks of Melchizedek and how he is a forerunner of Christ. And it says, and it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arise another priest who has come not according to the law of the fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. You see, Scripture doesn't say where he came from or where he was going. doesn't talk about his lineage. doesn't talk about any of that. He just pops up and disappears. And the Lord did that on purpose because Jesus is in the line of Melchizedek. He's not related physically, but he's like Melchizedek in the metaphor. And the Scripture is trying to speak to us. Jesus is definitely the one who is being foreshadowed here with Melchizedek. And we can see all of what Jesus does. Funny thing, priest and king in the Old Testament, it doesn't happen. There's a separation of church and state, if you will. You will not see kings being priests and you will not see priests being kings. They're separate. They come from two separate lines. Priests come from the tribe of Levi. Kings come from the tribe of Judah. And never the twain shall meet. In fact, when they try to, like Saul, King Saul tries to make a sacrifice unto God and Samuel shows up and says, what are you doing? He goes, well, I couldn't wait for you. He says, you just lost the kingdom, pal. It's Jersey version. So priest and king, this dual office, kings are from Judah, priests are from Levi. Melchizedek is one of three who hold both of these offices. Yes, this is a little like Jeopardy. <laughs> Jeopardy. There are three that hold this office. One is Melchizedek. Number two is Jesus. Jesus. First Peter says there's the third, which is you. It says you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Did you know that you're a priest and a king? The Bible, well, at least Peter says that you are a priest and a king, which means a priest intercedes before God on behalf of man. You guys do that? I hope you're praying for me because I need it. A priest beseeches God for others. That's what a priest does. A king is one who rules, makes decisions. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. By the way, if you're wondering what God's will for your life is, it's found right there. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. You once were not a people, but now are the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Can I get an amen? Amen. We've obtained mercy from God and we are now a people when we were not a people. And you know what? 
Look at this group right here. My goodness, we are all so different, different ages, shapes, sizes, economic strata, background. You would never see a group of people like this ever get together if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, which is evidence. So anyway, there are three. There's Melchizedek, there's Jesus Christ, who's a priest and a king, and he himself is also the sacrifice, not just the priest, and you. And so what does Abram do in response to meeting Melchizedek and the meal with the bread and the cup? And there's some evidence that they had some conversation and they talked. There was some counsel that was given and Abram does the right thing and he shares it a little bit. It says, and he gave him a tithe of all. You guys know what a tithe is? It's the Old Testament system in which God put in place, which was a requirement of the people of God to give to keep the priesthood and the house of God running. By the way, you guys are not limited by 10%. I don't believe in a tithe. Pastor, I can't believe you said that. Tithe was put on the Jews in the Old Testament. We've been released from the law. So what do we have now? Giving. God, God loves a cheerful giver, a hilarious <laughs> giver. That's what it says. The word is hilarion, actually. If we're, that's why I say it's hilarious, because God loves a hilarious giver. He calls us to not be limited by 10%. And, you know, if we're anything like Abraham, because God has given us so much, we can be generous. Amen? Amen. I can tell you, we have a lot of generous people here. I never have to beat people up for money. I don't have to stand here and talk about... Well, here's our chart, and we're trying to reach a certain number. <laughs> you know what? God is faithful, and I, I appreciate your faithfulness as well. So he gives him a tithe of all. In other words, he takes 10% of everything he just captured from all these kings, and he gives it to further his ministry. That's the first thing he does once meeting him, sharing the bread and the cup, and that's the first thing he does. He's got a heart of thankfulness. Isn't that what you do when you're blessed? Don't you want to give it away? Don't you want to share it with somebody? You get a new car. Don't you just want to take everybody for a ride? <laughs> or at least get them busy polishing it. <laughs> so he gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. It's interesting. We don't hear Melchizedek say anything. The king of Sodom shows up and he starts barking out orders. Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Ashkol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. Abram does something very, very wise here. First, he gives thanks. He gives thanks to Melchizedek. And then the king of Sodom shows up. The first thing Abram does in his response to Melchizedek is give thanks. You know what Thursday is? You guys are so smart. <laughs> you know what Wednesday is? <laughs> Wednesday, we're having a service right here. Yeah, that's right. And we're going to get together and we're going to talk about the things that we're thankful for, the things that God has done. And we're going to be thankful, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and I hope you like it. Because I'm going to put a lot of work into it. When blessed, he shared. And if he did that, then what should we do having been given eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord? How generous should we be towards one another in the way of forgiving and showing grace in all ways? Psalm 95 verses 1 to 3 says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great, the great God and the great king above all gods. We have reason to thank God. Everybody else, they say thanksgiving. Well, what's that all about? It's about thanks. Well, if God doesn't exist, who are you thanking? Right. Right. 
I want you to thank me for providing this <laughs> sumptuous meal here that you have upon the table. For every piece of dish that I have washed and every utensil, I want you to thank me. And that's what it becomes. It becomes idolatry, doesn't it? Thanksgiving is about God having given and us being thankful, which is one of those, you know, we need a recommended daily allowance of thanksgiving in our lives. He does not receive a thing for doing what he did. And he says, I don't want to do that because I know what you're going to say. Later on, you're going to say, well, Abram's a great man and he's got lots of stuff because, well, we funded him. He said, I've raised my hand before God and I made a commitment. God, I'm not taking a penny from these guys. Not a thread of clothing, not a sandal strap, not a shoelace. That seems pretty emphatic. It sounds like a prideful response. But you do understand that every gift given by somebody with not the right motive has a string attached. Yeah. Abram sees that and he knows not to make, not to go into business with the king of Sodom, not to be affiliated with the king of Sodom, not to be in a yoke of bondage with the king of Sodom. And he says, sorry, man, not, not going to do it. In 1 John 2.15, it says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If everyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. We have to be careful that things don't become a priority in our life as we tend to scrape people off our shoe. The problem is that we should love people and use things instead of using people and loving things. We tend to get it backwards. This world does, and if we're not careful, we'll pick up on that, and suddenly our things will be more important than people. If you ask to borrow my car, will I give you my keys? I should. I don't know if you fit it, but... <laughs> instead of accepting credit, for the victory, he redirects to God and he shares it with others who are involved. He thanks God for the victory. You see, he points to God, the God most high. He talks about God and he gives God. He redirects his, this guy's showing of thanks, which have strings attached, and he points him to God. And he points him to the guys who helped. And he said, make sure you take care of these guys. Don't worry about me. And I just think that's a very gracious move, isn't it? It's as gracious as saying, hey, Lot, you can go anywhere you want. I'll go the opposite direction. I'll stay out of your way. Abram's a gracious man. He can be gracious because God's made promises to him. Philippians shows us some of this grace in chapter 2, verses 3 to 8. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Because we have received the grace of God through Jesus Christ, his sacrifice makes it able for me to have a relationship with him, but not only that, an inheritance that he's promised. How should I then be towards everyone else? We should be the most gracious people that ever walked the face of the planet, right? We should be the most giving, most caring about considering other people's needs above yourself. Now, I know as soon as I'm done with this message, none of you will get in line to eat. <laughs> you will all wait in here. I think you can graciously say thank you and get in line and not make a big hubbub about it. But here's the point. All of this points to Christ. He's our savior. He's the one who came and died for us. He's the one who bled for us so that we might have the relationship that we have with God. How awesome is that? That should fill our hearts with grace and thanksgiving towards one another. And as thanksgiving is approaching, 
it might be good to kind of polish off that attribute, the thanksgiving part. We'll talk more about that on Wednesday. Next week, stay tuned. We're going to look at God cutting a covenant, what that means, God making a covenant, and what a covenant actually is. Uh, you guys might know a covenant as a contract. A contract usually has someone who's a seller and someone who's a buyer or two people who make an agreement. Uh, one's going to supply goods and the other's going to uh, buy those goods for a certain price. Those kind of contracts are made. But a covenant is different. And the one that he makes is very different. And we're going to look at it because it's not a contract. It's a covenant, which is also what marriage is. It's a covenant, not a contract. Contract means... As long as you're good to me, I'll be good to you. But as soon as you're not good to me, that's it. As soon as you short me a payment or you don't do what you're supposed to do, it's over. God doesn't work like that. He makes covenants. And it's a one-sided covenant that God is going to be faithful regardless of Abram's faithfulness. God has made a covenant with us through Jesus Christ. And it's not dependent on our perfection. It's all dependent upon what Jesus did on the cross. And aren't you glad? Amen. I pray that you guys are blessed as we go through the book of Genesis and hope that the Lord has spoken to your heart today.